Good morning, everyone. Today we'll be giving our weekly modeling update, which will show we're continuing to see concerning trends across the country, regionally, and even right here in Vermont. It's important for everyone to see this data and recognize we're not in the same place today as we've been over the last several months. Even though we still lead the country in so many ways, we're not seeing, and we're not seeing the alarming growth many of our neighbors are, we have to take action to make sure we don't. We've gone a number of months with such low prevalence of the disease that many have become more lax because the risk has been so low. But as will be shown, we continue to see a rise in cases which shows the risk is higher than what we're used to. The good news is we've proven we can change our trajectory, but we'll need to dig deep and double our efforts so we can protect the most vulnerable and keep our schools and economy open. Now, I know this is disappointing, but it's more important than ever to be vigilant, to wear a mask, stay six feet apart, avoid non-essential gatherings, and follow our travel policy. Over the last few weeks, the number of counties open for travel without a quarantine has been shrinking. As of today, it's down to about three. And the fact is, along with social gatherings, travel to and from other states without the proper quarantine continues to be one of the common denominators in our uh, rising case counts. So, as of today, we're temporarily suspending our travel map and requiring a 14-day quarantine or seven days and a negative test for any non-essential travel into Vermont. Our policy for essential travel remains the same, which means people traveling for things like work or school, medical care, personal safety, care of others, shared child custody, or to get food and not are not required to quarantine, but they should only be doing these activities and then returning home. When you consider the amount of red we're seeing in the Northeast and that it's not likely to improve for a few weeks, it only made sense to simplify the policy in order to ensure better compliance. The bottom line is, if you don't need to travel right now, don't. And if you do, or you have someone visit from another state, we need you to follow the quarantine rules. To help with this effort, we are also increasing our outreach and educational efforts. Mr. Sherling will update you on a plan to make sure we're seeing adherence to these rules at our lodging facilities, restaurants, and bars. I've also asked the Department of Public Safety and the Agency of Commerce to reach out to communities to remind them they have the ability to add restrictions should they want to take additional steps based on the cases in their own communities. And with traditional deer season upon us, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is also stepping up outreach to make sure both Vermont and out-of-state hunters understand our travel and gathering guidance. And as we previewed last week, we're also working to further strengthen our testing program because testing and tracing continue to be one of our best tools to contain spread without the more severe restrictions we had last spring. Dr. Levine will share more on a new testing initiative in a few minutes. Again, with the success we've had over the last few months, I know it's disappointing to hear about new restrictions. But by acting early and doubling down on the work that made us so successful in the first place, I know we can get this under control, hold on to the gains we've made, and continue to be in a better position to get through this faster and stronger than any other state. And just like I said since March, this is literally in our hands. And we've shown that what we can do when we all pull in the same direction. We need to think carefully about the decisions we make. Think about our wants versus our needs. And if it's just a want, let's hold off on that for a while. Because what we need to do is keep our kids in school for in-person learning and keep our businesses open and our workers working. This will take every Vermonter committing to wearing a mask, 
keeping six feet apart from others, following our quarantine and travel guidance, and limiting how many people you're coming in contact with. This includes limiting the size of gatherings, even small ones. And when you gather, as we advised last week, keep those to fewer than 10 and to one or two trusted families at most. And I do mean we need every Vermonter. So I'd like to speak directly to the skeptics for a moment. Those who aren't wearing masks or taking these other precautions. I understand this may seem inconvenient. And from your point of view, unnecessary, unfair, and difficult. But simply refusing to do your part is dangerous to the rest of us. It puts people you know, and in many cases people you love, at much higher risk. And it makes it harder for us to take steps forward to reopen our economy. So I'm asking you to think about what you can do to help us stop the growing wave of infections. It is starting to lead to more hospitalizations and sadly will surely lead to more deaths. Please do your part. I know it's a choice, but I'm asking you to make the right choice for the right reasons. Together, we can change our trajectory, protect the gains we've made, and keep moving forward. At this point, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichak to show more, show more on the data that's driving our decisions. Mr. Pichak. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Governor. Uh, this morning, we will uh, start out with an overview of some national data before turning to our regional data, some Vermont data, and then ending uh, with an update on higher ed and K through 12. As you can see from the first slide, yesterday the United States passed 10 million new coronavirus cases, the most in the world, and it was also the fastest that we got to an additional million cases. You'll see that we beat our previous record, which was set over the last million cases of 13 days, getting there this time in just 10 days. So you can see how more quickly we're adding cases here in the United States than we were at any other period of the pandemic. The next slide shows the U.S. case curve. Again, just the same point, but shown a different way. You can see back in the spring, we averaged about 31,000 cases. Then in the summer, 66,000. And now just today, we're averaging 112,000 cases per day. So you can see how dramatic that case growth has been. The next slide is something we haven't shown before, but this is the national forecast. So you'll see both that case curve that we showed that are confirmed cases, but then also for a six week out period, the number of forecasted or estimated cases that are expected in the United States. You'll see that we anticipate a 79% increase in new cases over the next six weeks. And on December 18th, we anticipate that our daily average will be just under 200,000 cases. So certainly the country is trending in a very dangerous direction. Looking at hospitalizations on the next slide, you'll see that uh, like the peaks before, hospitalizations are also on the rise. The thing that is interesting here is that you can see that the three peaks we've experienced in the spring, then in the summer, and now are all pretty similar in terms of the number of people requiring hospitalization. So it probably indicates there was some undercounting of cases earlier in the pandemic, but you can see that this wave is just as strong, if not stronger, than those previous waves we experienced uh, in March and April and over the summer. Heading to the next slide, you'll see that national death uh, chart, and you'll see again that we are seeing an uptick in deaths more recently, but it is different than the spring when we're averaging about 2,100 deaths a day at its highest point, and in the summer when we're averaging 1,100 deaths per day at its highest point. We're just under 1,000, but again, deaths is a lagging indicator, unfortunately, so when you see cases, you'll see hospitalizations will follow, and then unfortunately, you'll see fatalities follow that as well. So we have to keep a very close eye on our cases, our hospitalizations, and unfortunately our deaths. Turning to our regional update, uh, you'll see that 
Our region is not faring too much better. We increased our case count about 33 percent compared to last week, an additional 13,000 cases this week compared to the number that we had last week. And just to call out here, you can see that Vermont, we had just under 200 cases this week, certainly a very high number for us, one of the highest weeks we've had since the spring. But look at New Hampshire and Maine, who both had over 1,000 cases this week and have seen considerable growth as well. So we're seeing numbers increase here in Vermont, but they're also increasing around the region, um, something both for us to take caution of, but also something for us to be mindful of, that we still are in a better comparative position than pretty much any other jurisdiction across the country. Um, you'll see that the region over time, again, we're seeing cases go up. They've been going up for now 11 straight weeks. I also see in the last three weeks they have started to go up a little bit more rapidly than they did earlier in this most recent rise. And they're just over half as high as it was back in the spring. So clearly cases in the region continue to trend up. Looking at a couple of the jurisdictions within our region, you'll see that the seven-day averages over time for the whole pandemic, here for uh, New Hampshire, for Maine, for New York, and for Massachusetts, and you can see clearly that New Hampshire and Maine have far exceeded the case counts that they had back in the spring. And you can see the trajectory that both of those states are on, particularly Maine, which saw its cases double in just the last week. But then you can also see that Massachusetts and New York are also seeing steady case growth as well. Massachusetts is closing in on its uh, highest point in the pandemic, and New York is clearly seeing a strong uptick, particularly as of late. We've also provided a regional forecast, and unfortunately, the regional forecast is no better than the national forecast. We've seen our numbers go up over the last 11 weeks, and projected over the next six weeks, they're anticipated to continue to rise. They're anticipated to go up about 105 percent over the next six weeks. So as the governor mentioned, we've seen case growth nationally, we've seen it regionally, and unfortunately, it's projected to continue to go up over the weeks ahead. Turning now to our travel map, you can see the reason and the rationale for suspending the travel map. Very few places are eligible for travel. I think it's important to send a strong message to anyone coming to Vermont or Vermonters looking to uh, leave the state and return that a quarantine, whether 14 days or seven days with a test, is the safest approach that you can take both for yourself, your families, and for your fellow Vermonters as well. Turning to a national map that we show sometimes uh, that applies our travel methodology, you'll see that the map is really full of red. There's very, very few places uh, that uh, meet our travel standard. In fact, there are about 3,100 counties across the United States. Less than 30 of them would meet that under 400 standard or be green counties. So again, you can see how widespread this is across the country. And again, just to point out, some of these places in the country are seeing extreme case growth. Places in North Dakota and South Dakota, they're seeing tens of thousands of active cases per million. Here in the Northeast, we're still seeing you know, 800, 1,000, 1,200 active cases per million. So it gives you a sense of the scale that the problem is still considerably worse in other parts of the country. Turning now to our Vermont data, we'll look briefly at our Vermont curve. You'll see that this is identified as one of three periods where we've seen accelerated case growth back in the spring, the Winooski outbreak. And then more recently, we've shown this chart a few weeks in a row, but you can see how we're continuing to climb up uh, in case counts, how we have more simultaneous outbreaks now than we did at previous points, and that we started from a higher baseline of cases. So that all is certainly something we've got to keep a close eye on uh, and is concerning in terms of what we'll see over the next few weeks. Turning to the age of cases, this is from the beginning of the pandemic through today. You can see how old the people are that contract COVID-19 in Vermont on a 14-day average. You'll notice that earlier in the pandemic, the ages were higher. They got lower during the summer. But again, I want to point out that even on this metric, there's some cause for concern, as for the first time, uh, the average age breached 50 years old for the first time since May. And our baseline that we've settled into is higher than it's traditionally been for the last five months. Again, those that are older are more vulnerable to significant or severe complications, so that's something uh, that is also uh, concerning to us. Going ahead to the next slide, you'll see the hospitalization data. This is specific to Vermont. We have, like the national data, seen a trend and a slight uptick in our hospitalizations, both general hospital beds and ICU beds. So again, something that is a concern for us and something to watch closely. Not anywhere near what we saw in the spring, but still an uptick 
uh, and that would be somewhat expected based on the increase in cases that we have seen. Now looking at our Vermont forecast, again, not much has changed here. Our case growth has remained about where we uh, projected it to be, although the forecast is a little higher, showing cases expected to be between 40 and 60 per day on a seven-day average uh, over the next six weeks. So it is showing that continued steady growth that we've been uh, looking at very closely and somewhat concerned about uh, at various points and, and certainly concerned about today. I want to pause and, and just give a, an analysis that I think would be helpful for Vermonters as they make difficult decisions in the weeks ahead about spending time with their loved ones and their families uh, with the holidays coming up. I know once I looked at this data, we made the difficult decision in our own family not to s celebrate together in the traditional way. You'll see that there is just a lot to lose and if you make the sacrifice in the short term, you're certainly preserving a lot in that long term and many, many hopefully holidays ahead. So what we want to show here is a different is a comparison to Canadian Thanksgiving. And it really is a cautionary tale for us in the United States and us here in Vermont. If we see on the next slide that the Canadian Thanksgiving is similar in many ways to the Thanksgiving that we celebrate here uh, in the United States. Their Thanksgiving is the second week of October. This year it was October 12th. They have family gatherings. They eat a traditional Thanksgiving meal. Turkey is usually on the menu. They even have Canadian football games that are played that day. Um, and the one thing that's a little bit different than us here in the United States is different parts of Canada celebrate it more emphatically than others. So that allows us to look at certain provinces that did celebrate or do celebrate traditional Canadian Thanksgiving compares that, compared to those that did not. So again, if we can look at the next slide, you'll see four different provinces in Canada. These are the Canadian provinces out in the west, western part of the country that all celebrate a Thanksgiving similar to the U.S. You'll see that on October 12th, in the weeks that followed, every one of these provinces saw a somewhat dramatic increase in cases over the weeks that followed. You'll see that uh, every single one had a pretty low level case count that weekend of October 12th came and then in the weeks that ensued their cases grew quite substantially. They actually grew in these provinces plus Ontario over 200 percent since their Canadian Thanksgiving. If we go to the next slide you'll see the Atlantic provinces of Canada. These provinces do not celebrate it as um, emphatically as other parts of the country. Uh, they are less prone to get together and have a more traditional holiday as the western provinces. And again, you'll see here that they did not see a considerable uh, uptick in cases once the Canadian holiday came and passed. In fact, their cases actually went down uh, in the ensuing weeks since their holiday. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see all of that information together on two different slides. And you can see on a per capita basis, clearly those provinces that celebrated Canadian Thanksgiving, they saw their numbers go up. Their health officials attribute that to the holiday uh, gatherings. They put out plenty of warnings before the holidays, but there was some level of COVID fatigue and desire to see their families. And many people uh, continue to have that traditional Canadian Thanksgiving. But we want to send that warning and provide you that information about what can happen, again, if you uh, celebrate in the traditional ways. It's really a combination, unfortunately, of travel, which we're concerned about, and small indoor gatherings, which similarly we're concerned about. And Thanksgiving combines both of those elements. I want to turn now just to uh, talk briefly about our restart metrics. You'll see that uh, we did not include them here because they're pretty, um, they're all trending pretty favorably, even though we're seeing this increase in cases. We have plenty of hospital capacity. Our syndromic surveillance remains low. The two things that are ticking up are our positivity rate and our growth rate, and we're obviously keeping a cl close eye on both of those items. Turning now to our flu vaccination, you'll see that we're up uh, compared to last year. It slowed down a little bit, 4.4% over last year's numbers, but some of the data is not necessarily readily available, partly due to the cyber issues that are happening at the UVM Medical Center. So this is a baseline of how many people have gotten vaccinated to date. Likely that number is higher and we will get that information when it's available. Lastly and briefly on the K through 12 and college updates, you'll see that cases have gone up in Vermont. 
um, but compared to our neighbors, not nearly as high. We added 15 new cases this week across 10 schools, but New Hampshire added 103 cases across 49 schools, and uh, Maine added 25 total cases across 15 schools. So again, trending very favorably compared to our northern New England neighbors. And then last, looking at higher education, you'll see that um, we added about 83 cases in New Hampshire this week from higher ed institutions, uh, 36 from institutions in Maine, and Vermont did see a uh, 22 case increase from higher ed institutions. I'll note that over the last three weeks, uh, we've seen 89 cases from our higher ed institutions, but 84% of those are from the St. Michael's uh, campus uh, outbreak associated with the Central Vermont outbreak. So putting that into, compare, into relative terms and recognizing that uh, beyond uh, those few institutions, our higher ed institutions are performing quite well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Sherling. Good morning. As the Governor and Commissioner Pichek have uh, highlighted this morning, we've entered a period of time where following health and safety guidance to protect yourself, your family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, and others is more important than ever. Following the travel and quarantine guidance is essential. Being mindful of personal responsibility and safety in our homes uh, is equally important. And for businesses, doing your part as facilitators of travel and gathering to mitigate the spread of the virus has never been more important, not only for the safety of your staff and customers, but for, for the ongoing stability of our economy. As case counts continue to climb, the Department of Public Safety will be re-implementing and expanding a strategy used in the spring, uh, the assessment of key locations for compliance with health and safety guidance. The overall strategy is to use uh, state assets, including the state police, the Division of Fire Safety, uh, the Division, uh, excuse me, the Department of Liquor and Lottery, and in the days to come, potentially supplemented by local and county officials, to conduct plainclothes randomized compliance and education assessments. Uh, these compliance assessments will be directed at locations where out-of-state visitors requiring compliance with statewide quarantine requirements temporarily reside, lodging facilities essentially and places where people congregate focusing on indoor settings. These visits will occur with the primary goal of assessing the level of compliance statewide. Additionally, uh, as a side note, starting next week, law enforcement, beginning with state law enforcement agencies, will begin distributing COVID-19 safety cards during tra all traffic stops statewide as an additional educational effort. The checks that will occur statewide during a concentrated initial period, uh, beginning on or about November 12th, uh, will ascertain again that baseline of compliance uh, with essential health and safety guidance at, at certain types of businesses. All contacts will be logged and those documents will assess the rate of compliance in any areas where additional education strategies or action may be appropriate. While these preliminary visits are designed, again, to be assessments, uh, essentially compliance checks, if substantial noncompliance is found, multiple violations, staff or ownership that are actively resistant to educational efforts or safety guidance, referrals may be made to the Attorney General's office, as has been the case for the last eight months. It is our sincere hope that these assessments will illuminate widespread health and safety compliance and a continuation of our educational posture as we all work uh, to enhance safety as we move further into this challenging wave of increased infection. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to start by expressing our deepest condolences to the loved ones of a Vermonter whose recent death was associated with COVID-19. In Vermont, we've been spared from having to report such news for the past three months, even longer than that. Even as cases and deaths have surged elsewhere in the country, Vermont has not reported a COVID-19 death since July 28th. But this virus's potential to cause illness and death has not gone away. 
It can still devastate families and communities. It can prey upon people who are older and who struggle with chronic illness or other underlying conditions. So we mark this somber occasion, the state's 59th death to COVID, remembering that each death is not just a number, but a person whose life was tragically cut short by the disease. I ask everyone in Vermont to join me in honoring this latest loss by recommitting to doing everything in our power to prevent this virus from spreading. I cannot say this enough. To stop the spread and to protect each other, we need to act, and as you've seen from the data, we need to act now. We are truly on a threshold here, and the decisions we make today will truly determine our future. And I don't mean our long-term future, I mean our immediate future. Again, remember the data you were just shown this morning. That's why we announced an advisory on Friday that social gathering sizes should be 10 people or fewer, with a very limited number of trusted households. And I want to emphasize the or fewer because that does not mean you should have 10 people in your house. Again, because you can does not mean you should. The safest approach is to stick to your own household, especially when it comes to indoor gatherings and when people are eating, obviously without masks on, like at a Thanksgiving dinner. And in this regard, we do need to um, learn from our neighbors to the north regarding the Canadian Thanksgiving data, which I find quite compelling. We must also learn from a collection of Halloween events that our contact tracers have been investigating and providing affected individuals guidance on. And keep in mind, these are with adults. It's also why we're announcing today a suspension of the cross-state travel map. The fact is our entire region is in danger from the surge in COVID cases happening right now. And it's very clear that things will not improve anytime soon. Looking at the map of red today is very instructive. We see an island where there are patches of yellow and green which is, of course, Vermont, except unlike other islands that have been successful in confronting the coronavirus, which include the Canadian maritime provinces, Singapore, Taiwan, New Zealand, and the island continent of Australia, we are, on the other hand, surrounded by a sea of red. That's very challenging circumstances indeed. That's why I want to keep every Vermonter's focus on my two main points. Severely limiting travel and being extremely careful and cautious regarding small gatherings beyond immediate family. Travel increases your chances of getting and spreading the virus, so we need to avoid traveling as much as we practically can. Anyone who travels now must remember one thing. They need to follow Vermont's quarantine rules, no matter what county they're coming from or are traveling to. Travel now equals quarantine. Just to reiterate what quarantine means, that means staying home and away from other people for 14 days, with of course the option to end quarantine after seven days with a negative PCR test as long as you don't have any symptoms. I know it is very hard to hear about staying local and limiting our gatherings, especially with the holidays coming up. But you've seen the rising case numbers. A high of 43 reported Sunday, the largest one-day increase since the spring, until we reviewed last night's laboratory report with 46. As always, any decisions we talk about up here and any guidance we provide will always be data driven. You've heard the data and you've seen the projections. The health department has been responding to and monitoring 20 outbreaks and 63 situations, including in schools, childcare programs, colleges, healthcare facilities, 
work sites, and social gatherings. And our largest outbreak that originated with the recreational ice sports now stands at 125 cases, including 76 of those at St. Mike's. So COVID is clearly among us and it is spreading. I've said that many times that our workplaces, healthcare facilities, schools, and more, they're all a reflection of our communities. So the more we see COVID in our communities, the more likely we are to see an outbreak tomorrow. Everyone in Vermont has worked so hard and collectively been so proud of our recent track record with returning our kids to school, opening the business and healthcare sectors, keeping our seniors in skilled nursing facilities safe. If we want to continue to keep our schools open and our economy open and our facilities free of COVID, now is the time to truly commit to doing our part. Even now, a few weeks before Thanksgiving, we need to take every precaution and stay away from the kinds of gatherings where we might let our guard down. Whether it's a birthday, a barbecue, or a trip to deer camp, we need to keep social circles small and look for these things. Six foot spaces, masks on faces, uncrowded places. And if you do or did recently socialize with people outside of your usual social circle or attended a crowded event, please avoid close contact with others and consider getting tested. You can get tested now, as well as seven days after the event or gathering. To find a test site, go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 testing. Call your health care provider if you develop any symptoms at any point. I'd like to transition now to a few items regarding testing. Testing in Vermont has been robust. According to the New York Times, we rank number one and are at over 2,000% of our testing target. Yet we recognize that it is still not readily available to everyone, precisely when they need it or want it. To remedy that, we are entering into a contract and speedily working toward a plan with CIC Health of Cambridge, Massachusetts to offer testing every day of the week at locations all around the state. The test will be a PCR self-administered nasal swab. This is part of our ongoing offense against the virus. This is part of our fight. Additionally, we are markedly increasing surveillance testing to better understand the level of virus that is in our communities so that that will allow us to quickly contain it and prevent the kinds of clusters and outbreaks we are seeing. Remember, surveillance testing is done in a population to assess how much virus is present in people who are otherwise feeling quite well and don't know that they may harbor it. I'd like to focus on teachers and staff in our schools first. They, like everyone, are a reflection of our local communities. And because of that, we're working with our agency of education to stand up testing for K through 12 teachers and staff as soon as next week. And then starting the week after Thanksgiving to offer testing to all teachers and staff in one quarter of the schools each week so that each month teachers and staff in all schools will have been tested. Our contractor will provide the training, technical assistance, supplies, and laboratory analysis. School districts will communicate with staff, will create teams to administer the testing, and the state will provide the funding, manage the contract, and provide electronic reporting of test results directly to the individual. Our health department epidemiologists and public health nurses will, as always, contact any person who tests positive to provide public health guidance and to conduct contact tracing. The health department's website will list schools where there was a person who tested positive in school during their infectious period. This testing program, again, will help us find cases as early as possible, especially among those adults who have no symptoms and don't realize they're infectious. And they will, of course, help us keep our schools open 
and students having the benefit of in-school versus remote learning. Just to be clear, testing of school personnel is a public health surveillance strategy. Teachers are very special, but they don't have very special standing or uh, are at higher risk, and that's why they've been selected for testing. They represent a large group of individuals in an organized setting. Again, they are special. School personnel who are awaiting for asymptomatic surveillance testing results do not have to quarantine. They should continue to work. And testing of school personnel does not replace the need for any of the prevention measures that we've been talking about, including avoiding travel and avoiding large gatherings. Finally, I do again want to thank Vermonters who've been following all of the guidance, clearly making tremendous sacrifices. This has been a life-changing experience for all of us and deciding well in advance that this is the year that they might stay home for the holidays and reduce the size of the crowd around their table. I know we will find other ways to connect to make the time together with our own households special because how we choose to celebrate affects our family, our community, and Vermont. This is Vermont. We've weathered a lot through this pandemic so far, and I know we can, can continue to keep it on. Finally, I will be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A regarding vaccine and therapeutics updates, but we spent enough time this morning at the podium so I want to turn it back to the governor now for the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, with that, we'll open up for questions. All right, it's 11.40 and we have 22 people in the queue. We'll start with Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. So probably a question for Commissioner Sherling. Um, I can only think of a handful of cases from back in the spring uh, where the Attorney General got involved. I'm wondering what the threshold, you mentioned, you know, there has to be sort of a repeated um, violation. We have to have repeated violations. I guess, what, what is that threshold? How many violations do you need to have? And also, what, what are, uh, could people be looking at in terms of fines or uh, punishment? Thanks for the question, Kelvin. Uh, working from back to front, um, we haven't yet contemplated uh, exactly what enforcement uh, would would look like in terms of a fine structure or something like that. Um, the you're right to observe that only a few uh, issues made their way to the attorney general's office. Again, that's because uh, Vermonters have been largely compliant with uh, with guidance and followed the health and safety rules. Um, this is again, it's a, an assessment check. Um, it, what I was trying to convey uh, in terms of what could yield follow-up during this first round is if we showed up and there were, uh, we're not really talking about repetitive violations because we're not going back to check on um, folks that have been on the radar before, but if we showed up and let's say uh, XYZ restaurant was doing none of the things that they're supposed to do, that might trigger immediately um, uh, a higher level of scrutiny. And likewise, if, uh, if the educational effort fell short because there was active resistance, which again, we've only seen on a couple of very uh, unique occasions through the last eight months, that might trigger uh, an enhanced response right out of the gate. But right now, we're just trying to assess um, what the level of uh, compliance and, and also equally, um, you know, are, is the message getting to the key places? Are there additional educational messages that we need to get out? And maybe this is more of a question for the governor, but bars and restaurants and, and those sort of establishments, they're in the public eye, so they kind of face scrutiny from the public more often. At what point would the state need to start, I don't want to say cracking down, but um, in, in taking enforcement action or, uh, I guess, educational action against private gatherings and parties, especially as uh, that's the mode of transmission that we're talking about here. Yeah, again, very difficult to do. Um, so that's why we're trying to make our case for why this is so important. Uh, we're seeing an uptick uh, in the number of gatherings uh, throughout Vermont. People are getting more, more lax. 
uh, we saw an uptick even over the Halloween weekend, uh, where I believe uh, that there are a number of cases that are tied to those uh, events. So again, when we're heading into something maybe even more substantial, like Thanksgiving and then Christmas following, uh, it's more important than ever uh, that people understand how quickly uh, this disease transmits and how quickly it can spread amongst your family members and friends and so forth. So um, that's what we're trying to do at this point. Um, again, we're not we're not contemplating enforcement uh, uh, with uh, with private gatherings. Uh, more in the public eye and commercial establishments work there uh, first, and then uh, again trying to make our case. And then I guess one last clarifying question. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned COVID-19 um, safety cars, I think, or uh, something having to do with cars at the border. Maybe I misheard you. Was there a mishearing you on that? Uh, yes, um, I pr probably was uh, mumbling a little. Uh, cards. So oh, oh, cards. on all traffic stops um, with state law enforcement and then potentially moving out to, to local and county as well in the future. Um, we're going to take that opportunity to remind folks uh, not only of the traffic safety uh, issues, but of uh, COVID issues as well. Those are in the works right now. Hope to have them deployed next week. Ross? So, Governor, the last time we were seeing these kinds of individual jumps in cases uh, on a given day was when we were still in the middle of the stay home, stay safe order. Is that something that might be on the table in the coming weeks or maybe a modified version of something like we saw in March and April? Yeah, I mean, we're not taking anything off the table, but obviously we're trying to be strategic, surgical, and trying to tighten the guidelines and making sure that we're doing everything we can within the existing restrictions uh, to make sure people are being safe, and being smart, using common sense uh, in terms of their every, everyday lives. So that's the first step. Uh, we'll continue uh, to monitor the situation on a uh, I, I, even more so, it's not just a day-to-day -day basis, it's almost like on an hourly basis. Uh, what we're seeing in terms of uh, the data that comes back in, and we'll be relying on the health and safety experts uh, to guide us. Uh, again, we, we meet literally every single day, and uh, we talk about these things, uh, and, and we try to anticipate what's going to happen next and what we can do to alleviate uh, the, the spread of this, uh, this virus. So. It's an ongoing effort. Nothing's off the table, uh, but, uh, but certainly we want to live within the restrictions we have in place right now. We've learned a lot about this virus over the last eight or nine months, and uh, and I still don't believe we'll be going back to to that what we saw in in the spring in March uh, because we've learned a lot about what we can do to prevent that. But but again, nothing's off the table. But but it won't be in the in the near term. And I know that we're, we're right now we're turning off uh, the travel map, uh, making that quarantine requirements for any kind of out-of-state travel. But we are seeing a lot of transmission here within the state with people moving around. The, the, the ice sports uh, outbreak you know, being a prime example of that. Is there anything that can be done to either uh, guide people to not travel uh, within the state or suggest they don't visit certain areas if possible? Well, again, what we're trying to do is make people more aware of what they're doing. I mean, having a gathering with 30 or 40 people, uh, a private gathering in a house or something of that nature, that's not uh, that's not acceptable. That's not what we're trying to uh, to uh, to educate people on. It's really uh, about wearing a mask. Those simple things we talk about all the time. You know, limit the gathering sizes. Uh, wear a mask when you're around others. Keep six feet apart. Wash your hands. If you don't feel well, don't go to any of these events and really pay attention, be aware of your surroundings. And uh, we'll get through this, uh, but uh, it's going to take all of us uh, to, to make sure that we're adhering to those simple guidelines that we've set out and we've talked about since the beginning. But I think, again, we're a victim of our own success. Uh, when we look at uh, us compared to other states, I, I watch Wyoming, I, I talk about this in, in the press conferences. I, yesterday, uh, for the second day in a row, they had over 700 cases in Wyoming, smaller population than, than we have. 700 cases in one day. They did this over two days. So they have more cases in one day than we have in a week, uh, by far. So we don't want to be in that position. And that's why we're continuing to, to tighten the restrictions just a little bit at a time to make sure uh, that we're, we're really um, looking at the, uh, the total picture.
and what we can do to prevent the spread. Thank you. Uh, Governor, what would be the effect of these restrictions now on the hospitality and uh, the ski industry right at a critical time where we're getting into the season? Yeah, again, it, it, uh, it may be critical in some respects, uh, and, and obviously uh, the hospitality sector has uh, been devastated uh, by the virus and the economic ramifications of such. Uh, that's why we're working so hard uh, to try and uh, make sure that we have any funds that are left over. Uh, we, we presented a plan to the, uh, the legislature, the Joint Fiscal Committee, uh, for $75 million worth of economic relief for the, for the economic or the, the uh, hospitality sector in particular, uh, because we know this is going to be a long road ahead and uh, very challenging uh, for them. Um, so w if we can take some of these ste steps uh, to make sure that we're protecting them so they can survive over the next few months, uh, that will, until the vaccine arri arrives, and we've heard some good news about a vaccine, uh, but uh, once we can safely distribute a, a vaccine uh, widely uh, dispersed, um, then we can get back to some sort of normal. But in the meantime, we need to take these steps in order to get to the end. And, uh, and I know that's going to be difficult you know, for the hospitality sector. But, but if we think about, you know, we're right here in the, uh, you know, the slow point in, in terms of uh, the hospitality uh, industry in particular, uh, stick season, so to speak, uh, in, in Vermont. If we can take these steps now, uh, maybe we can get to a point when in January, uh, when things start to, to get a little bit more um, uh, attractive uh, for skiers and so forth, we'll be in a different position. But that's why we have to take some of the steps now. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, everybody sort of breathed a sigh of relief uh, earlier in the week here when the announcement about uh, the, the vaccine, the newest vaccine to come on and its efficacy or possible ef efficacy. Uh, what would you tell Vermont? Have you read anything about it and, and what still needs to be done before we get to that point of distribution and, and uh, you know, it's good to take that deep breath, but. <laughs> yes, and I, and I know we presented a lot of uh, pessimistic data today and hard things to digest that we don't really want to see. We want to deny them. They don't exist. Uh, my messages haven't been as upbeat as I'd like them to be. So I do want to be upbeat about a vaccine, um, perhaps more upbeat than I've been all along. Um, when a company reports uh, 90 percent effectiveness rate. That's sort of like way beyond anybody's wildest expectations. Now, none of us, us meaning the scientific community, have had a chance to really see this data and understand it better. But the reality is, even if it was 75 percent, you know, that's remarkable. So we should take some, um, have, have a little dose of optimism about the vaccine. But I want to make it very clear to everybody and, and, and reiterate my dual pathway approach that have to be done together. Pathway A is what we're doing now. All of the guidance about distancing, masking, washing, et cetera, and especially about travel and uh, gatherings. Pathway B is very gradual uptake of vaccine, state by state by state across this country, beginning with very high priority groups and finally culminating in the general population. Because the timelines are very different, pathway A is we've got to just keep doing it on and on and on into 2021. Pathway B is the estimations are that by the spring, most optimistically, and then into the summer, the vast majority of the population may have some access to a vaccine that's safe and effective. So that's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Wilson, the AP. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hi everybody. Um, I'm curious when there's been so much talk of uh, the, the resurgence that you're presenting, has there been any thought of uh, setting back up some of those emergency hospitals and those types of uh, things that were used in the spring that uh, never ended up being used that much? 
But uh, could those come back? And if so, when and where? We, we still have one uh, set up in Essex at the fairgrounds, uh, Wilson. So uh, that's still there, and we can quickly adapt if necessary. Uh, but, um, but I might let Secretary Smith answer that. Wilson, we, um, in, with, in, in concert with uh, Commissioner Sherling, when we took down the facilities that we had, and obviously, as the governor said, we haven't taken down completely uh, the facility at the fairgrounds um, in, uh, at Champlain Valley Fairgrounds in Essex. But when we took them down, we took them down in such a manner that we could mobilize them and build them right back up as quickly as we uh, took them down. So we have the ability to scale up quite fast and quite significantly. The issue will be staffing uh, as we get uh, into this and start looking at it. One of the things that we haven't done, we, we excuse me, one of the things that we have not forgotten to do is continually watch these numbers and be prepared for a surge. As you know, we always have been looking at a surge as we move ahead. But we're going to continue to watch these numbers and react as, uh, as we can. We have the capacity to build up to these numbers. We'll get the staffing to, uh, to man these areas, particularly, and I want to point out, the National Guard has been a wonderful partner in all of this. And by the way, throughout this, whether it's testing, whether it's food distribution, whether it's uh, manning these uh, surge facilities, they've been a wonderful partner and they deserve a lot of credit. So we're ready uh, if need be. Uh, we still, Commissioner Pichek does uh, provide us um, projections on flu and uh, COVID-19 hospitalization data. And uh, so far, we look okay, but we're, uh, we have the ability to surge up if we have to. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I could just, if I could just add one more thing uh, in regards to the National oh. Guard. Uh, they, did, uh, they did help us out with a cyber unit at uh, UVM Medical Center and are still active in that regard. So uh, we'll add that to the list of accolades uh, for the Vermont National Guard. Okay, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. The 59 people who died from COVID, how many of them had underlying conditions? I'll let Dr. Levine try and answer that. We've actually characterized that population very well because as you know, until July 28th, um, the majority of the deaths had occurred in that window. Only one has occurred since then. Um, I would direct you for the precise numbers to our um, website, um, where I believe on one of the weekly updates, we've looked at the hospitalized and the death populations. But the re reality is that a majority, a vast majority of the deaths in Vermont have involved people who had uh, many, many chronic comorbid conditions. Um, and we're also predominantly, but not exclusively, in the higher age range, you know, above age 60 for sure. Um, and uh, a number of them were associated with an outbreak, of course, uh, in several of the Burlington area nursing homes. So we, we've got all of that uh, there, but that's the uh, snapshot for you. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Uh, Joe, uh, one more thing. I just want to uh, talk a little bit about our demographics um, because that does come into play. We're one of, uh, uh, we're the second, I believe, uh, oldest states in the country. We had a demographic issue before pre-pandemic. Uh, and so uh, when you look at some of the numbers, and, and I looked at some of the cases from last night, and about half of those uh, um, positive cases uh, were over 60 years old. So, again, we can't uh, we can't um, 
we have to observe that uh, that we have a, a aging demographic here in Vermont, and this is going to continue uh, to to be the case uh, throughout the pandemic. All right, we'll go to Joe at the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello. Uh, I'm not sure who would get this question, but it actually involves a personal experience I had. I was speaking with my sister the other day about Thanksgiving, and um, she said that she had looked at various uh, sites and seen that the area of the country she lives in um, has the same high rate of um, active COVID cases as Orleans County. And she asked why, in that case, I needed to um, quarantine if I went there or why I might be reluctant to go there. Um, I know what I told her, but maybe you have a better answer than what I had. Dr. Levine. So remember that Orleans County was not always uh, at a high rate. Uh, that's a very uh, current recent phenomenon. Um, and we do believe some of the activity both in Orleans and in Essex County um, does relate to cross-state travel, but uh, I'm sure there are other explanations as well. The reality is I think we can, I, I optimistically feel that listening to the kinds of things we've been talking about this morning provides us with a very unique opportunity to look at that data, look at the rate in Orleans County, and reverse that. Um, it's, you know, the virus preys on people congregating together, people who don't know they're infectious predominantly, uh, congregating together um, and spreading through small groups. It shows that being in rural America doesn't matter because uh, it's about as rural in Vermont as one can get. And Wyoming, we would also regard as a very rural place, uh, yet they're having you know, astounding numbers of cases per day. So I would look at this as an opportunity uh, because I do believe uh, if we focus on the small groups, and we focus less on the travel, but more on the need to quarantine any time travel has occurred, knowing that Orleans, just until recently, had a very low rate, and all of a sudden, uh, the rate has increased. So making sure that quarantine is adhered to by anybody, whether they're from out of state or whether they're a Vermonter who has chosen to leave and come back to the state, uh, that will really get us on top of the situation, especially when we pair it with our offense strategy of making sure that testing is available to people when they want it, when they feel they need it, when it's appropriate uh, based on exposures. And when we have our surveillance testing, which is already uh, happening, uh, but more now expanded to the uh, education sector, uh, I believe we have a very good opportunity to really make sure that that sea of red that's encroaching on us doesn't uh, totally engulf us completely. What did you tell her? <laughs> um, she's my sister. I think I'll leave that out of it. <laughs> no, um, no problem. <laughs> yes. Um, but I do have another question, and this goes to your offer to talk about um, scientific matters. Um, I understand that uh, a couple of the things that um, have been mm, controversial in past months have had some results from studies, namely the question of possible oxygen deprivation for masking for older people and also the um, utility of hydroxychloroquine. And I was wondering if you had anything to say about that? Sure. Um, with regard to the uh, masking of older people, um, 
Are you implying that the research has said that that's fine now, where it might not have said before, or the opposite? Well, I mean, you're the one who probably would be better able to okay. interpret the research. No, no good, because my, my interpretation is actually it doesn't really matter what your age is. Um, and there have been only, unfortunately, very limited physiologic studies that look at people's carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, as a result of masking. And though you can cherry pick the literature and find a study that would support masking being uh, counterproductive in that regard, the majority of the literature shows that whatever your age, you should be able to wear a mask and it shouldn't injure you in any way regarding your ability to have your oxygen level where it needs to be. Hydroxychloroquine has been uh, fast and furiously studied, and um, the, the consensus is whether you're using it for therapy, meaning you've already come down with COVID, whether you're using it for therapy in conjunction with another antibiotic, azithromycin, or whether you're using it uh, for prevention, uh, as the president once did uh, many months ago. Uh, none of those pathways has really proven themselves to work. And it's not a major part of our armamentarium in addressing ill people with COVID or people who don't want to get ill with COVID. Great, thank you very much. Andrew, GNAT TV. Um, Um, <clears throat> this is a question that came in from one of our viewers, uh, and I'm not sure how your announcement today may impact this, but uh, the question was, uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act requires that certain employers provide up to 10 days of emergency paid leave to employees who are subject to state quarantine order related to COVID-19. This benefit expires as of December 31st, and if current guidelines around travel remain in place, employees will be forced to take unpaid leave from work when required to quarantine. Has the state given any consideration to the impact of travel guidelines on workers as they relate to the expiration of federal emergency paid leave? Um, we have concerns about the deadline in general, um, Andrew. It, the December 31st is, is really driving a lot of the decision making uh, in trying to anticipate that because the funds uh, that are left over need to be spent by December 31st. So um, I'm not seeing any uh, hope that the lame duck session of Congress is going to act, uh, but, um, but you know they could surprise us as well. But we're going to need relief um, very, very soon in a number of different areas. So that's just one of many uh, issues that we're going to, uh, we're going to have to contemplate uh, if they don't take action. But I, you know, it's maybe a better question for our, our congressional delegation. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Aaron, VT Digger. Um, um, with, the, with the new testing contract in place, um, are we going to see a rise in the expected number of tests conducted per day, or is it more about who we're testing? It's really, the, the major issue is not necessarily to increase the number per day, but to increase the access to testing, and to increase the access at the time it matters to the person who wants to test that may well end, uh, eventuate in an increase in the number of tests. Um, but as I said, looking at the New York Times data, we don't have a numbers issue. And even when the university and colleges leave town for their uh, Thanksgiving break, which will go on for several months, uh, we're still gonna be well above our target level of testing in the state. Uh, but I think when you're trying to um, I'm going to adopt Secretary Smith's term. When you're hunting for the virus and you really want to be able to do the containment strategy, um, that's the last time you'll hear me say that. Uh, when you want to do the containment strategy, 
so that you don't have clusters and outbreaks develop, um, you do want to be as aggressive with testing as possible. And um, if you look at the New York Times data, you'll still see that there's not half, but somewhere between a third and a half of, a of the country that hasn't reached its target of testing. And then you see Commissioner Pichak's slide about where the United States data is going. So I'm confident, based on our uh, contract that we've discussed, and all of our own testing stockpiles and supplies and strategies we've been using all along, that with this additional strategy of on-demand and with the surveillance component, uh, we will increase our number of uh, tests. That doesn't mean I want to see us increase our number of cases, but obviously we will increase our number of tests. Our percent positivity rate so far, in spite of the increase in cases we're having, is not dramatically rising, but we're watching that very, very closely. Yeah, um, we have some questions from listener uh, readers as to whether that testing, you know, numbers and, and the testing goal would still be met if you took out college and university testing, because that obviously has formed a big component of, um, you know, testing in recent months. So it's kind of a question of is testing overall been rising uh, for people who are just getting, um, you know, the pop-up tests or symptomatic tests, or is that increased just because of college and right. university testing? No, well, that's that's a very valid uh, concern for sure. We'll still be uh, having a lot of testing even without the college students, though I can assure you. Um, I also want to reemphasize testing is detection, but it is not prevention. So um, just because testing is available will help us find more virus and take care of it quickly. However, prevention is really the key to our success. And again, I'm very confident in Vermonter's ability based on how we got to where we are today with those many, many, many months of uh, virus suppression that we've all enjoyed. Uh, but now, surrounded by our sea of red, I'm confident Vermonters can again uh, redouble their efforts and work on uh, keeping the virus at lower levels. Okay, and just as a quick um, kind of clarification, the surveillance testing specifically for K-12, is that for the holiday time period or is that kind of an indefinite plan going into the future. Yeah, that, that will begin uh, for many prior to the holiday, for all right after the holiday, and it will continue. It's not meant to be a, uh, let's just see what the impact of Thanksgiving is. This, is. this is a strategy that will persevere until we're all vaccinated and uh, doing well and enjoying our lives like they used to be. Okay, that's all, thank you. Mike, Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, just a uh, follow-up. Did the uh, UVM Medical Center ask the Vermont National Guard for the computer help, or was it the National Guard themselves that has to be activated to try to help? And, and what is the threshold to activate the Guard for a private entity in Vermont with a problem, say, if National Life or or construction company or hardware store on Main Street had a problem? How did they get activated for that? Um, uh, well, a couple things. Uh, first, it started out, uh, the National Guard brought it to our attention uh, that they had this unit that was available and ready, willing, and able to help if necessary. Um, we, uh, we then uh, were in uh, talks, obviously, with the uh, UVM Medical Center and they came to the conclusion that they could uh, use the National Guard's help if it was if the offer still stood, and that's when I signed the executive order. Um, I think when it rises, you know, it's it's discretionary on the on my end uh, and from the governor's office uh, to activate the guard. Um, so if it, in this situation, when it's risking of public health, I think it rises to that level, and we would take every case um, the same way. You know, if it rises to a level that really impacts uh, the, the vast majority of, uh, of public health and within the state, 
uh, then we would activate. So again, case by case basis. Okay, good. Uh, I might, might ask uh, uh, Commissioner Sherling to, to go further on that possibly. Thanks, Mike. Uh, go the governor's exactly right, uh, case by case basis. Um, important to note that the Guard has been used in other states on a handful of occasions since these cyber capabilities were developed. Uh, and one of the coordinating efforts that happened in the background was emergency management. And Director Borneman uh, reached out through channels in emergency management to ascertain under what circumstances um, and, uh, and what track record there was for uh, Guard involvement in this kind of a, a sweeping uh, uh, issue that in impacted uh, public health and safety. Okay, so basically, public health and safety is the, the threshold. Uh, somebody on Main Street that has a company, uh, National Life or Ben and Jerry's, that wouldn't necessarily be an issue versus a hospital. Well, you know, certainly uh, we have to prioritize. But if it uh, if it was, you know, connected to uh, economic uh, catastrophe or of some sort and and uh, dissemination of, of uh, personal data and so forth I mean obviously we would we would contemplate that as well it's just the the level of the extreme nature of it to uh, to impact the public okay and for Commissioner Harrington or secretary Curley we've received a few inquiries about UVM Medical Center employees from a couple of towns Currently, the employees at some sites have been ordered to stay home and not report to work while they sort through the uh, computer system problems and everything. Uh, and they've been told they have to, they're forced to take vacation time against their will, and some colleagues may not even have vacation time, so they go without pay. Is there any state program or anything the state can do to make these employees hold and not be forced to take time off without pay? Yeah, I believe they, they were I believe they were furloughed Mike but uh, maybe uh, Commissioner Harrington or Secretary Curley one of the two might be able to answer that I so I um, I don't want to speak out of turn and, and not without talking um, in more detail I saw the the article that came out about it um, if they were furloughed or, or temporarily laid off without pay um, then uh, they could potentially be eligible for benefits um, there are some uh, safety nets in there in terms of, of time off, but again, if they're if they're using um, paid time off, whether it be vacation or other, I can't speak to what agreement they have in place, but those those would make it so they were not eligible to receive uh, UI benefits at the same time. These sound like these have been cases where in, in recent days. Suddenly they're told, don't come in today or don't come in tomorrow, whatever. Not like they've been furloughed. It's just we don't think we're going to have enough work or whatever and take tomorrow off uh, without any sort of pre-warning or understanding. Yeah, and I, I couldn't speak to that without having a more detailed conversation. So I'm, I'm happy to follow up and get back to you, Mike. Okay, I'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Peter, BPR. Commissioner Levine, will uh, teachers and other school staff be required? I think you were getting the flavor of this question. <laughs> In case you're unable to get back on, the answer is it is not a requirement. Uh, they can keep their job and not get tested. However, I think it would be in their best interest and in the best interest of their community. Uh, Peter, I think we lost you. I hope that answers your question. Uh, and if, you, if you, you can follow up, if not. We'll move on to Ed at Newport Daily Express. <laughs> My question is going to be about the, what I hear are school staff shortages in different school districts across the state. Can uh, you speak to that and tell me uh, if that's actually if it's accurate and what is being done about it? Uh, Secretary French, are you on the line? 
Uh, yes, I am, Governor. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, the issue of staffing shortages is, is, is a very real one. Um, you know, again, they existed prior to the emergency, but certainly the emergency uh, has brought those concerns to the forefront. Um, our major approach to that is, you know, we anticipated that um, in our planning. The districts, um, you know, have the ability uh, to, to toggle, if you will, between remote and in-person just uh, based on staff availability. Is there going to be a point, I mean, you know, to have the statistics, if you will, is there going to be a point where we're not going to have enough staff to take care of our students? Well, that, that could be a very real concern. Um, you know, once again, I think, you know, those kinds of issues were present prior to COVID and um, in our, my travels around the state uh, prior to COVID, I know many districts were struggling filling uh, different positions. And, um, you know, once again, it's an assess of our larger demographic challenges. Um, but I think, you know, right for now, districts have, have some flexibility um, in terms of navigating that issue. Um, but it remains to be seen to what extent that will actually uh, cause districts to uh, have to shut down. I raised this in part because up in the, uh, Derby Elementary School, uh, they had a couple of uh, positive COVID cases, and there's quite a ripple effect uh, where uh, it's not just the teacher at the school uh, that, that can't come into work, but a teacher who lives in Derby with students in the school there, but they teach in a different school district, have to stay home to take care of their kids. So it's, it's not always just what impacts you at that particular school, but the ripple impact it has across the economy. No, absolutely. I mean, our communities are all interconnected, and particularly up in North Country, uh, you know, where there's, where there's a lot of uh, staff commuting in from different locations. but does underscore the importance of, uh, of giving some districts some flexibility because the conditions are different from district to district. Thank you very much. All right, and <clears throat> Peter Herschel is back on the line and he did have a, a follow-up question. So go ahead, Peter. Apologies. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if somebody is able to quantify what you believe the impact on interstate travel will be as a result of temporarily retiring these travel allowances? Well, we certainly hope it's reduced. Um, we'll be collecting that data uh, and comparing it to what we've seen in the past few weeks, as well as what we saw last year uh, in trying to determine what effect that will have. We'll, we'll be ramping up the messaging along our highways uh, as well as trying to, again, make sure we accurately uh, collect the data so we see whether we're having an impact or not. And Commissioner Sherman, will your compliance checks be exclusive to um, businesses or will you also be trying to get a bead on whether or not individuals are complying with quarantine rules in effect here? Thanks for the question. Uh, the primary emphasis right now is areas where people uh, are, con are, are coming if they're traveling, so lodging facilities, and places that are facilitating congregate environments like uh, restaurants and bars. Um, no plans at this point to expand that, but we'll, uh, again, it's, uh, this is a point in time to gather some information uh, based on what's happening out there right now, and, and uh, we'll assess from there. All right, but it wouldn't, you're, you're talking to the, to the restaurant and bar and, and lodging owners themselves, not the individuals who are uh, frequenting those establishments? That is correct. Thank you. All right, now we'll go to Andrew at the Caledonian Record. Yep, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, Seems the change of posture on the travel map is not really a change of policy from a practical sense, but one more of messaging. Um, how confident are you that this, uh, the social gathering recommendations and the renewed appeals for Vermonters to mask and distance will really move the needle on rising cases? Yeah, um, well, you, you point out uh, the fact that this isn't really a change in, in guidance. It just uh, reemphasizes what we think is important at this point in time. And we're hopeful. Uh, obviously, we've seen a great benefit here, experienced a great benefit in Vermont from 
compliance from people doing the right thing uh, when they hear uh, the message. So uh, we're leaving it up to, again, all the media, all of you, uh, to to try and do all you can uh, to get this message out because this really will make a difference. If we can, if we can all come together right now, uh, we can avoid uh, you know some of the 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 more long-term effects of, uh, of the spread of this virus in the coming months until we get a vaccine in place. You know, I know that's going to be a ways off, uh, but that's the goal. We need to mitigate this as long as we can uh, to try and suppress this uh, so that we can, uh, we can get to the other side and keep our businesses whole as well. And that's going to be really important because the restrictions, the travel restrictions that we're putting into place will have a ripple effect, will affect our hospitality sector in particular. And if we, if we can uh, convince the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, to, to uh, allow us to move forward with our plans to use 75 million to help those businesses survive uh, in the coming months, uh, again, we'll get to the other side of this and be much stronger as a result and be able to come out of this stronger than any other state from my perspective. And um, is the forecast that Commissioner Pichek showed us earlier with the state approaching 60 cases a day by mid-December, is that an acceptable outcome and within, um, within the guardrails? Or if we stay on that trend, uh, do you see further restrictions uh, and measures being necessary before we actually get to that point? Yeah, none of it's acceptable. Well, we'd like to be back to where we were in the summer, but from a practical standpoint, we have to uh, deal with what we're we're seeing on the ground, and what we're seeing is a, a higher case count as we move in indoors. We anticipated this, though. I mean, as you might recall, back a month or two ago, we talked about uh, the possibility that as we got into the colder months, uh, people moved inside, uh, that this would happen. The case counts would would increase. Um, so this isn't totally unexpected. Uh, but I think the severity, from my standpoint, the severity of what we're seeing around the country, particularly coming into the Northeast, and I watch the New York numbers, the Massachusetts numbers, you know, Maine and New Hampshire in particular, um, this, um, this does give me pause. I am concerned uh, because their rate of increase is vast, uh, vastly um, compounded uh, from ours. And, and I'm, uh, I'm concerned about that. And, and again, what I see in the Midwest, the Dakotas and Wyoming and so forth, again, this is, uh, this is concerning. It should be a concern to us uh, throughout the country. And if there's time uh, for uh, Commissioner Levine, uh, can you describe the rolling testing method for the teachers? Uh, are you looking at doing a, a snapshot of teachers in each section of the state? Um, or are you going to go quadrant by quadrant? The goal is that we test all teachers and staff in one quarter of the schools each week so that every month teachers and staff in all schools will have been tested. So that is a rolling kind of arrangement, but it's meant to cover the universe of schools effectively so that no school will have gone more than a month without testing. That's the bottom line. I, I guess my question is, are you going to tackle the state by dividing it into region, you know, quarterly regions? Ah. And then so you know, for instance, uh, schools in the Northeast Kingdom will be uh, tested in week one, and then they won't be tested. No school will be tested for a full month in a, in a particular region. Yeah. Or are you going to have a handful of schools from each section of the state each week? Yeah, that's a level of detail that we're working on as we speak. But I kind of agree with the strategy of not restricting it to a region at a time, because true surveillance testing gives you a snapshot on a very uh, statewide basis, and if we were just to restrict it to a region at a time, that might not be as early a indicator as we would want that uh, things were ahead in a particular place. So I, I think we can devise a strategy that will go statewide and uh, selectively impact schools uh, across the state. 
Okay. Thank you all for the time. All right, and just a quick time check. It is 12.30, and we're only about halfway through the queue. Kat, WCAX. Hi, I have a couple questions about testing with the new partnership. Will those tests that are offered through the Massachusetts Company Partnership be covered by either insurance or health department? And also, what might those testing sites look like in terms of locations? You know, are there specific spots you're looking at around the state? And then when might that partnership be up and running? Kat, I'll try to answer all your questions, and if I forget one, please, please repeat it. Um, here's how we plan to do it. That partnership will uh, provides us with supplies. It uh, provides us with logistical support. Um, what will happen is basically you will register uh, for a test at a location that's near you. That location could be a, um, a, a medical facility. It could be a FQHC. It could be your local... Uh, fire department um, administered by EMT. Uh, we're working on those locations right now. Uh, so it would be open seven days a week. Those are the, the sort of things that we're doing right now. The partnership with the, with the CIC is making sure we have the supplies, making sure that we have the equipment, making sure we um, have the scheduling sort of process that's down to help us and assist us with that sort of thing. The test will be going uh, to Broad Institute, come back uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and what else did you need to know on this one? So there is no cost to people for these tests? No. And then do you have an idea of when this might be up and running? Uh, I would say within the, we will roll it out, but I said we're starting to roll it. We'll start to roll it out within the next uh, week or two. Cool. And this next question uh, is also related to testing. I noticed the last health department weekly data summary showed that there were 22,000 plus tests conducted over that particular week on 5,500 people, which averages out to about four tests per person. Um, can someone walk me through why there would be that many more tests than people? Is it from a lot of the higher ed surveillance? Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of higher ed surveillance, and Dr. Levine can come in and correct me. There's, there's, there are several reasons for that. People are getting tested every week, um, so they're, you know, it's one person, but they're getting multiple tests. Correctional facilities are getting tested. Long-term care facilities are getting tested. The same people are getting tested on multiple occasions and so that's what you're seeing as you're uh, as you're rolling as you're looking at those numbers thank you you're welcome greg the county courier good afternoon governor um as we've said many times that running the state more than just responding to COVID 19 uh, yesterday in St. Albans, we experienced a law enforcement response where a 17-year-old was arrested um, in response to possessing an explosive device. Um, we're seeing this as another example of uh, a, a new law where useful offenders are not named and, and are unable to be prosecuted as an adult, are you in support of this uh, law, or do you believe that it should be looked at to kind of go back to the system that it used to be where it relied on the judicial system and prosecutors to determine whether to prosecute as a, as a youthful offender or an adult? Yeah, well, I understood. Um, the premise for the law change, I had my concerns as well. I might ask uh, Commissioner Sherling to weigh in. I don't know much about the case in particular in St. Albans, but I know you're not asking about that, uh, but just in general. But, uh, but again, some of these, uh, these cases uh, that um, um, are of a high level uh, of, uh, in terms of public safety, um, I think should be, should be out in the open. Uh, from my standpoint, but again, um, we'll see what the legislature decides to do. Commissioner Sherling, anything to add to that? 
Thanks for the question. I would just uh, observe uh, for clarity for listeners that um, what the one of the changes to the laws did was invert the uh, the initial place where a case starts. So for a 17-year-old uh, charge under these circumstances, historically that would have started in adult court and a petition would have to bring it to juvenile court. It inverted uh, that process. So it starts in the family court and would have to be uh, moved um, from there. So. Uh, there is the possibility that uh, youthful offenders with certain types of charges can still be charged as adults. It's just a, a technical um, component that starts it in a different place now. Thank you. Um, and quickly, in regards to the cyber attack at UBM, um, I'm under the understanding uh, from people who are both working there and um, have been patients there that nursing staff, nursing and uh, doctor staff um, are using personal cell phones and texting medical information from one to another uh, because of the UBM system being down, which certainly brings up another security issue. Um, has the state been in any discussion uh, at the state level on how workers can communicate, um, but continue to uh, mitigate any unwanted security measures? Sure, it's Mike Scherling again. Um, I'm not familiar with what you're describing. I do know from ongoing conversations with uh, leadership at the hospital that two main forms of communication workarounds have been established. One, they have an entire unit that's doing uh, secure fax transmissions uh, of records, and the other is uh, old-fashioned paper. All right, Tim McQuiston, okay. about Business Thank Magazine. You. Hi, thanks, Governor. Uh, a couple of things about the $75 million. It's, 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 I understand it's um, uh, basically doubling the amount for the, the existing grant program. And the, you know, the people are people out there are kind of wondering where that $75 million come from. But as a, I understand it, um, there's some federal money that came in uh, for the health care, uh, support health care, and therefore it's now freed up. But I'm wondering, you know, where that money is coming from. And also, how you're deciding to put it towards this program when I'm sure there's a lot of other people um, interested in this. And the other, my second question has to do with lodging, and I've, I've heard some complaints from regular like hotels and motels, et cetera, that, that people are skirting the, the guidance by going to Airbnb. And then, of course, it's easier to go to a 250-room hotel than it is to hunt down the uh, uh, various Airbnbs. But, uh, Anyway, those are, those are my two questions. Yeah, we're, first of all, we're aware of the BNB, uh, Airbnbs, and we're trying to get a handle on that as well. But as you stated, it's difficult um, because it's uh, more singular and then uh, in a quantitative uh, fashion. So we're, we're on that. We're trying to uh, come to grips with that. Um, the money uh, wasn't, uh, didn't come through directly for uh, the um, healthcare facilities, but we had determined uh, that that was the need. Uh, I'll let Secretary Smith describe what we found. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, the legislature at uh, our urging had a, a approved setting aside a certain amount of money uh, for the health care stabilization uh, fund. And the health care stabilization fund was to help recruit, uh, re help uh, healthcare facilities recoup from lost revenue uh, and or added expense uh, as a result of the shutdown and or added expense of uh, COVID-19. The first round, we, we issued about $87 million of, uh, of money out to various facilities. I think we uh, there were 350 applications. I can't remember how many uh, that we provided in terms of the money, but it was $87 million. We're now in round two. We have 236 uh, applicants. Uh, we estimated that we would not be using all of that money, and therefore, um, even with round two, uh, given that we, in round one, it was $87 million, we don't think we're even going to uh, match round one. Um, that we were going to have significant amount of money left over, so we we uh, um, you know we 
<laughs> went to finance and management and said uh, this money can be reallocated. And as uh, you've mentioned, it's been reallocated, the $75 million, um, to uh, economic recovery, which I think everybody, uh, most, people, most Vermonters agree, is needed during these times. Is, was, is there more than $75 Mike, million and going somewhere else, or is that, that's pretty much what it is? The whole package was over $100 Yeah, the, the whole package was over $100 million. Um, some of it was reallocated to AHS, some of it was a, a, a reallocated, a, a reallocated elsewhere. Um, I don't have the specifics on where each item was reallocated. Um, I can get that for you, but um, I, I don't have it right here on, at the tip of my tongue. All right, great. Thank you, Mike. Governor, this is Secretary Young. Um, Go ahead. I could, thank you, Governor. Uh, Tim, we um, did a reconciliation through mm -hmm. October 29 of many of the grants and appropriations that were funded with CRF, and especially the closed grant programs are our best estimates. We um, found that we had about 114 and $17 million that we um, could reallocate. We put together a $116 million plan for the legislature. How we reached the reallocation number and what our plan uh, consists of is posted um, most readily on the Joint Fiscal Committee website if you want to go there now. Otherwise, I can send you the C2 spreadsheet that show you in precise detail where money was moved um, to make up the, the pot of money for reallocation. That, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, as well, Tim, we know the, the need is far greater than the $75 million that we're proposing, but it's all we have left at this point in time. But it's really hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that is needed, and in particular, uh, the hospitality sector. Thank you. Dana, Local 22. Hello, um, my question is, what would you say to the people who think they're fine to go home for the holidays because they'll be around their family members, they feel like they can trust them, and with that mentality, what types of consequences could this have for the community? Yeah, I mean, basically, they're not. Um, I think uh, when you think about all the people you come into contact with on a daily basis, and think about getting all those different people together in one setting, um, that, uh, that's when we start to see the spread, and it, and it spreads so quickly uh, and uh, so easily uh, that uh, you may think uh, that you have some sort of defense from it, uh, but, uh, but all you can do is mitigate it to the best of your ability. But in a, an inside setting uh, with people you're not, uh, don't uh, interact or don't, aren't somewhat uh, family members that you see on a daily basis and are new, um, you just don't know the extent of the tentacles. Uh, so um, I would say uh, for those who think that, uh, that they're immune to this, uh, they're, they're just wrong about that. And this could be, uh, could be tremendously um, hurtful uh, to, our, to our efforts to contain the spread. Thank you. Avery? Uh, WTA? Governor, kind of piggybacking off of that question about gatherings, will there be any new guidance about churches? We received a question from a viewer just wondering in cases, I'm um, in the strong message uh, from you all about not gathering with people who are outside of your household. Yeah, the other, the other uh, guidelines are still in place, uh, the existing guidelines. Uh, they, we have not changed them at this point in time. So uh, anything that we've been doing thus far, uh, again, I want to emphasize, make sure you wear your mask, keep six feet apart. Uh, if you're sick, don't go. Uh, and, and try and uh, find other ways to do this. Do it remotely if you can uh, in, uh, in some of those social gatherings. And uh, it just may not be worth the risk. Uh, so think about what you're doing, being aware of the situation and who you're going to come in contact with. And you're gonna have to make that det uh, determination on your own. But, uh, but again, it's, it could be risky at this point in time. Could we see an official reduction of the gathering size in the form of an executive order um, as it was earlier on? Yeah, Look, everything, as I've said, everything's on the table and we'll just have to see how successful we are in uh, trying to put these measures forward, restricting travel or restricting the, the size of, 
of gatherings in your home and uh, we'll take action as needed uh, as we move forward but uh, but right now uh, it's the only thing we've done really is to uh, uh, to postpone or pause uh, the, the travel into the state without a quarantine uh, from any counties outside of uh, outside of the state so anytime outside if you're coming into the state you must quarantine um, that's the basic message thank you Hadley, the Valley Reporter. Hi, Governor. Um, kind of going off this quarantine theme, I wanted to ask, how does the 14-day quarantine requirement apply to out-of-state hunters or um, college students with ski passes? Can those people still participate in those recreational activities and be considered quarantining if they stay away from other people? Uh, Dr. Levine, I don't believe so. Um, you, you know, it's in terms of essential workers, uh, that's, uh, and I read a list in my opening remarks and can get that to you on who does not have to quarantine if they come into the state, but, uh, but skiing uh, it wasn't on the list. Dr. Levine, anything else? You know, I mean, we, we love having people come to our state for recreational activities. Um, it is very challenging to be so isolated that you come in contact with no one else uh, or no other surfaces even uh, in your existence. So certainly essential work, essential educational needs, um, um, those are you know, essential grocery buying, those are important things, but um, you, you get on a slippery slope if you begin to, not a pun intended, uh, you get on a slippery slope if you try to continue to make exceptions for various aspects of people's need to cross the border and the kind of recreation they want to do. All right, thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, uh, 1,645 property owners on the red tag list need uh, fuel tank replacement or repair before they can receive fuel oil delivery. What is the status of providing temporary fuel storage tanks or other relief measures to help people living in these buildings stay warm? Yeah, we, we do have a program for that. I might ask if uh, it's... Is Julie on the line? Governor, this is Secretary Moore. Yeah, I'm, thank you. I'm happy to help answer that question. Um, so we, we do uh, have grant programs um, to help folks with the cost of re replacing their oil storage tanks. Um, we are also you know, understanding that there is a, a backup amongst contractors uh, required to do that work, uh, working with individuals to come up with one-off solutions. Um, if they are in the position of being in the queue to have their tank replaced, um, and just haven't been able to get the contractor on site yet. If, if you know of individuals who are having a particularly challenging time, um, please encourage them to, to reach out to the department and we can help them make arrangements um, depending on the specifics of their um, individual circumstances. What kind of arrangements? Are you saying that there will be some people can actually get their fuel tanks filled as long as they're on the list? Or they, generally, we, we are because these tanks are considered to be structurally unstable, and it, it again depends on the specific conditions um, that have resulted in the tanks being red tagged. Um, but we can make arrangements for either um, more limited fuel deliveries um, or, or alternative structures. But certainly, we, we don't want Vermonters to go cold as the weather is turning. Alternative structures being what temporary fuel tanks or? Potentially, it really it depends on the site specific okay. circumstances and the, the condition of the tank um, that has, has received the red tag. Okay, thank you. Uh, Governor, uh, not all reliable national media have called Pennsylvania for President uh, Joe Biden and said he has 270 votes. Given the National Associated Press that called Pennsylvania for Biden was also very critical of the president, wouldn't cover the Hunter Biden laptop story. Do you wonder if maybe you've jumped the gun a little bit in congratulating him as the president-elect? No, I don't believe so. I think uh, 
even the senator uh, from a Republican senator from Pennsylvania has uh, faith in the in the process and believes that the election would go to Biden. So I don't believe that I jumped the gun on this. Okay, thank you. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, um, I think this is a question for um, Commissioner Pichek um, overall. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could kind of walk through the best practice when it comes to both operations and messaging for businesses that deal with the public, like stores, uh, retail stores, restaurants, when they encounter a situation where they have a worker who either tests positive or may have been in contact with somebody who tests positive and then they are in a quarantine situation. It seems like we're seeing all kinds of variations on this theme where some businesses are really upfront where they will close for several days. They have messaging to their customers saying, here's what's going on. And people seem to appreciate that understanding. But then there's others that are super vague that make it not very clear in terms of what's happening where they say, oh, we're just close to clean, everything's fine. Um, and given the fact that this is going to be going on for a while, we're going to be living with this, it seems as if um, there's two, there needs to be more consistency in terms of how businesses handle this and what people should expect to, to hear from the businesses that they frequent in terms of their own information and, and managing their own risk and, and their movements, et cetera. Yeah. I, I think we went from Commissioner Pichek, and then I thought it was Secretary Curley, but the longer the question, it's either Secretary Smith or Commissioner Levine. And if we need to tag team, we'll, we'll do that. Um, bottom line is that, um, number one, if there's a true case in a business, that means they had a positive laboratory test and the health department is aware of that case. The health department, through interviewing the case, interviewing the proprietor of the business in terms of a list of who else works there, etc., cetera, um, and contact tracing, determines uh, if that individual was actually present in the business on a day when they could have been infectious to others, and if there are indeed others who are at significant risk. So it may seem, uh, you didn't use the word random, but it may seem random to you, uh, but the guidance is very specific based on the assessment of risk. There are times we have actually not been aware of some positive results until later in the process, due to the fact that they may have been different types of tests that didn't come through our system the same way. And um, the faster we learn about that, the better. Because we actually want to be a resource for the business owner. And um, if I could extrapolate this to the schools, this works extraordinarily well in the schools. Because there are countless Sunday night phone calls with teachers, principals, superintendents regarding what to do on Monday because a, a lab result came in over the weekend. And the guidance uh, can be very clear and specific from a public health standpoint. And when there isn't enough information to make that decision, we err on the side of, let's take a pause from uh, in-person in learning, and in this case with businesses, a pause from being open uh, while we collect the information we need to help you make that decision and be cautious at the same time to protect everybody's health. So that's my kind of answer to what you've asked. Secretary Curley, do you Hi, have... this is Secretary Curley. May I weigh in? Yes. Uh, hi, so it's great. I just want to follow up on what Dr. Levine was saying. I've worked with many employers. Um, the, the volume is increasing, unfortunately, in the last few weeks, but they reached out to ask um, exactly that. Like, what do they do when they find out if a customer who has been at their business or an employee um, has tested positive for COVID? And the, the best advice, um, is, as Dr. Levine said, is if you call the health department immediately, um, I can actually even give you that number if you're ready. It's 802-863-7240, option 7. Um, they've been incredibly responsive, even on the weekend. And if you call them, they will help you problem solve. Because I think 
what so many businesses struggle with, as Dr. Levine said, is whether they should be tapping the brakes, whether they should be sending out a notice to all their customers. And so the, the folks that have, have utilized the health department in this situation have reached back out to me to say how incredibly helpful it was. So that would be um, just, just enhancing that message to make sure that you are communicating what you have learned with the Department of Health and getting their guidance. Thank you. That's helpful. So it sounds as if the guidance from the health department is that it, you would advise businesses to try to be as forthcoming with their customers, et cetera, as possible to let people understand what's happening. I would say that is the case. Um, we want people to be forthright. Withholding information only delays uh, the response and then uh, encourages the spread of the virus itself because uh, because time is not on your side when you have something uh, of that uh, uh, of that magnitude exactly thank you thank you very much that's that was what i was hoping to hear <laughs> call in seven days Hi, thanks. Um, so I am curious, can we get an update on the current testing lag time at UVMMC due to the cyber attack? Do you have any idea, um, say someone gets the test today, how long it might take for them to hear back? Secretary Smith. Yeah, I'm, Colin, I'm not sure I can give you precise um, a precise estimate of what it is. It depends on the lab that they send it to, is whether they use their own lab, whether they send it to another lab uh, for those results. I will say we, I met with uh, uh, UVMMC yesterday and asked them about any backlogs in terms of notifications. Uh, and they have said at the beginning um, there was a backlog when it first hit. They have worked through those backlogs in terms of notification. Positives were notified quickly. Uh, the negatives, they worked through the backlog, and, and they told me yesterday they don't have a backlog now in terms of notifications. Obviously, what we were doing before the um, cyber attack was diversifying the platforms the things that we're talking about in, in making sure that if we ever had a shortage of reagents or anything along that line at UVM or elsewhere, we had a diversification of labs and platforms we could use in order to do that. This has accelerated those discussions and hence, you, you, you know, you, we've talked about the seven day testing uh, capability that we're, we're building up. So. To answer your question, as of yesterday, they told me on notifications there were no backlogs uh, in terms of what they are notifying the people that are, have been tested. Um, you know, testing has gone on uninterrupted. Got it, thanks. And then the only other thing I wanted to ask about was the news out of Burlington's um, wastewater monitoring program there seems to be an alarming spike in the city plant that serves the new north end. And I was curious whether the health department has yet indicated any um, clusters there or whether, whether it's um, planning on um, deploying some testing um, given those readings. Yeah, I'll let Dr. Levine talk to that. We're aware of uh, those results, and I'll let Dr. Levine talk about that and our plans for testing in that area. Um, just to very briefly introduce the broader public to the concept of wastewater testing. Um, this is a surveillance strategy. It's not one that has been as scientifically validated as the strategies we talked about earlier in the press conference. However, it does provide an opportunity to do what we would term community-based surveillance. Um, it's being done by the City of Burlington in conjunction with investigators at Dartmouth and at UVM and in a private research capacity to really get down to understand this um, as a tool, but in a research capacity, if you will. And basically it monitors the wastewater that are leaving either buildings 
or facilities, or in this example, a catchment area of the entire city of Burlington. So this has to do with one of the three catchment areas, and basically what the results can tell you is, is there any SARS-CoV-2 virus in the wastewater? And more importantly, is there a trend in one direction or another? So we've looked at data longitudinally with the city, and basically they've had, other than minor blips in their trends, a pretty stable picture until very recently, where there was a quite escalating uh, level uh, not at a time when necessarily the neighborhood was experiencing to what we were aware of uh, a major outbreak. And so uh, having seen that got everybody's not only curiosity up, but wondering if we should be doing something more aggressively. So uh, the city, I believe, is trying to hone in a little and instead of just have it from one wastewater plant, have it uh, from what locations in the community are feeding into that wastewater plant to see if they can get more specific about uh, where that is coming from. The promise of this, I'll call it promise because it's still somewhat theoretical, but uh, in some parts of the country it's been used this way. The promise is that five days later, you may see actual symptomatic people or more positive tests in the community that had a trend towards increased levels of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater. So we have got testing actually going on uh, in the city of Burlington every day of this week. And uh, if the city's other results that they're trying to uh, come in with can be more even targeted, uh, we may actually target the testing even more finely within the city. But there's access within the city to testing uh, the entire time. So I'm hoping actually that this isn't a harbinger of uh, any kind of increase in cases that we'll see, but we will learn from this because it's the first time it's happened in this project that's been going on for several months since the summertime. Thank you very much. Tom, VT Digger? Yes. Go ahead, Tom. We're getting reports about it. Thank you. <laughs> We're getting reports about an outbreak of cases at a Rutland nursing home. What can you tell us? Uh, Secretary Smith. Thanks, Tom. We've had an outbreak at a Rutland, um, Rutland uh, Health and Rehab uh, where there's been seven positive residents and one positive staff. They've started a co cohort, a, uh, a, a positive unit cohorting staff and, uh, and residents. Um, all PPE has been deployed uh, to, that, uh, to that skilled nursing facility. So. Um, that's what I know right now. I know that uh, Dale, the department, uh, was uh, meeting with the facility as we speak uh, to see what the needs and how we could react. I know that the rapid response team that we developed way back when in April uh, to these kind of outbreaks has been deployed and we'll know more probably in the next few hours or so of what we're going to do. This um, also, um, you know, we do periodic testing on uh, various uh, skilled nursing facilities. This may prompt that we increase that testing capability uh, throughout the state given the numbers that we're seeing here. So the the, the, the number of times that we test, a, test per month may, may be increased given what we're seeing with the rise of the virus in the state. Can you confirm the name of the nursing care facility? Yeah, I just did. Uh, Rutland Health and Rehab. Uh, and could I ask one more question? Uh, Google and Apple have an alliance that allows uh, contact tracing through exposure notifications. That is, people can opt into a system in which if they get COVID, a notification can be sent to every other phone that was in proximity to the COVID patient's phone in the prior 14 days. Is that something that Vermont is considering? 
I think it's being utilized in Vermont, but I'll let uh, Commissioner Pichek answer that. So Tom, we do uh, utilize mobility data that we get through third party you know, providers, um, but we haven't used the Google, Apple um, technology yet. We have considered it all the way back from September to now. We're looking at how the other states are doing. You know, I think there are maybe 10 or 12 states that have um, built their own app and started down this partnership. Uh, we're also finding that they're not necessarily getting a, a lot of uptake from their citizens. You really need to have a pretty good amount of people uh, on those applications for them to be valuable. So we're waiting to see how um, well and how successful they are uh, before putting the resources and energy into that. Sure, great, thanks very much. Uh, that's it. Uh, I just want to remind everyone tomorrow is Veterans Day and it will be unusual not to have some of the, the celebrations and um, parades and so forth uh, that we normally see. Uh, but if you have an opportunity, uh, just think of that. Uh, something as simple as just reaching out and thanking them for all their sacrifices, all they've done for us over uh, these many, many years. And um, if you really want to honor them, really want to help them, especially our World War II vets, our Korean vets, and uh, those who served in Vietnam, um, wear a mask, you know, protect them like they protected us. So that's the theme of the day. So thank you very much. We'll see you on Friday.